Greetings, dear friends. Welcome to Church in the Home. We're so glad you're in our audience today and you've joined in with us in an audience here in Dallas, Texas, in my home. So wherever you are in your home or building or wherever you are worshiping the Lord with this service, we pray God's richest blessings upon you. Today on this particular service, I'd like to make mention of and give honor to another one of our faithful workers. That's the fellow we call Love More who is in Malawi, South Africa. Now, Lovemore has been with us for many years. Lovemore was a school teacher, and this message came his way and revolutionized his life, and he and his family have given themselves to spreading the message of the Christ life throughout Malawi. Malawi is a little country uh, just northeast of South Africa, and it's filled with people who need God. Lovemore has given himself to these people, and today I honor him. And I ask all of our friends around the world to bear up Lovemore in your prayers. Just keep him before the Lord that God would bless him and use him. Well, we're glad that you tuned in today, that God might do something special for you. And I'm going to bring the word, and just before I bring the word, we're going to have a message in song from Dan Oliver. But before any of that, now, Robbie is here, and she's going mm -hmm. to talk to you whatever's in her heart. Do I have that much time? <laughs> well, this is a family affair. Um, we, we're sitting here with our Dallas uh, uh, fellowship here. They've come in from uh, distances, and um, so we're having a good time today. We have food, and we have fun, mm -hmm. and we have fellowship around the Word, and it's just really a nice time. And... Um, we just greet everyone out there in our listening audience today. Um, you're very important to us. We, we thank the Lord for all of the people that he has joined with this fellowship to enable us to continue what the Father has given us to do. As Warren mentioned about Love More, he is one precious dear heart, and he gets on his motorcycle that the fellowship purchased for him, and he travels all over Malawi taking this message to those who are hungry. Besides a school teacher, he was also a Presbyterian minister, and he tried to uh, imbibe these, um, these uh, truths of Christ being in the believer and being the life of the believer while he was a, a minister in the Presbyterian church. But um, they thought that was heresy and didn't really want um, to go that direction. So Lovemore was basically... Uh, what we call kicked out <laughs> of, 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 the, of the church because, uh, because of his heresy. But it was really a move of God because he has, he has really sought the Lord. He's given himself to studying the word. And the Holy Spirit is the one that has taught love more and brought him into such a fullness of the scriptures and the revelation of Christ as his life. So um, this fellowship has... Uh, has reached out your your faithfulness has uh, enabled this body of believers to support love more every month this body supports love more and uh, we see that he gets to the South African uh, conference twice a year it's a long long journey three days it takes love more to get from Malawi to the, the, the conference so just thank you so much for all you do to enable this fellowship to continue I just had one thought of scripture today I want to share, and it's in uh, Philippians 1, 6. And um, not only is it a comfort to, to my heart, to me personally, but to my loved ones, to, to, those, who, um, to those who I would really <laughs> like to see, see doing it better, <laughs> getting with it more. Um, this scripture says, being confident, confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until, until the day of Jesus Christ. And you know, that's really a wonderful confidence we have in our Father and in the work of the Holy Spirit and in the power of this word. I know today um, the Holy Spirit will bring to my mind scriptures maybe that I learned as a child growing up. Not necessarily <coughs> that I just read this past week, but something way, way back. He'll, he'll bring it to my remembrance and it's something that nurtures me or, or gives me direction or gives me comfort. And so we can really trust the Holy Spirit and we can trust this word because it does not return void. But it, 
you know, we raised our children, we, we, we raised our families in the, in the nurture of the scriptures and of the Lord, and we can trust and we can depend on the Holy Spirit to, to finish the work that he has begun in, in these lives. You know, the scripture says, be anxious for nothing. And we mothers find plenty to be anxious for, don't we? You, you men don't. You men don't. We women do. <laughs> but, um, but when you read a scripture like this, it really does help to just to realize you don't really have to be troubled and anxious, that you can really rest in the Lord. You can, you can rest in his work, that, that he that has begun a work in our loved ones and in our families and in those that are dear to us, we'll, we'll c finish that work. And um, so I just praise the Lord today. I'm so thankful for the Holy Spirit. I'm so thankful that um, he does exactly what he was sent here to do. He was sent here to teach us Christ. Uh, I grew up where he was everything but that. He was my power. He was, my, he, he, he was the one that made me live a good life and a righteous life and all this. You know, he was the one... He was the one, um, but, but he does exactly the purpose that the Father sent him to here to do, and that's to teach us Christ, to bring the things of Christ to us and to reveal them to us and open up uh, our understanding to those things of Jesus Christ. And, and I'm just so thankful that he is faithful to the Father to do those things that the Father sent him here to do. So we just welcome our family around the world. Uh, this uh, CD or DVD, whichever you're on, uh, the very uh, a couple days after we've done this tape, it sent 25 of them are sent to South Africa right away, and we started getting letters from South Africa from those who are receiving these monthly. How much this is blessing them! So, I hope you're enjoying the ones that you're getting, and um, just uh, hang in here with us. We got a lot of miles to go yet, and we really appreciate you making the journey with us. Amen. This song here talks about the miracle that we see every time we look outside. And we don't have to look very far at what God has created and know that certainly our creation and our life and everything that we see is a miracle. But the most important miracle of all is the fact that God has placed His Son in us. And this song sings about that. It's titled, It's a Miracle. What drives the stars without making a sound? Why don't they crash when spinning around? What holds the world when the world's upside? No, what holds me, world? <laughs> ah! I gotta look at my notes. Okay, I learned the stupid song. Okay, here we go. You know, all we have to do is look at what God has created and know that everything that we see is a miracle. But the biggest miracle of all is what God has done with us and placing His Son in us. And this song speaks about that. It's titled, It's a Miracle. What drives the stars without making a sound? Why don't they crash when spinning around? What holds me up when the world's upside down? I know. It's a miracle Who tells the ocean to stop on the sand? Who keeps the water from drowning the land? Who makes the rules I don't understand? I know it's a miracle A miracle, oh just enough God is with me wherever I go It's a miracle as big as can be that he's placed his only son in me who shows the birds how to build a good nest how can the geese fly so far without rest why do the ducks fly south and not west i know it's a miracle oh what makes the brown seed so tiny and dry burst into green and grow up so high and shoot out blossoms of red by and by i know it's a miracle a miracle oh just enough god is with me wherever i go it's a miracle as big as can be that he's placed his only son in me when the spring makes a brook and a brook 
makes a stream, the stream makes a river as fresh as can be. And who puts the salt in when it gets to the sea? I know it's a miracle. There are millions of people in cities I see. The world must be crowded as crowded can be. But God knows my name. He cares about me. I know it's a miracle. A miracle, oh yes it is, I know it's a miracle. I'd like to encourage every one of you to prepare to get to a camp meeting. We have two camp meetings coming up right now. Our first camp meeting will be in South Africa in Bloemfontein the last weekend of April. Those of you who are in the southern part of Africa can make that camp meeting. We have workers in Botswana, we have workers in Malawi, we have workers in South Africa and other places and they'll be coming to this camp meeting in Bloemfontein. I hope that you get there. And then those of you here in the United States, we have our regular annual camp meeting which will be in Ridgecrest, North Carolina at the big, big uh, conference center there and it will be on uh, July 30th to August the 4th. A grand opportunity for folks here in the United States to get together and I trust that you will join with us at this time. Take your Bible if you will and turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 1. This is the second part of a message which I began last week or last time that we got together and the message is entitled in its total the birthing and I talked about the birthing as it is presented in the scriptures of the many occasions and what the birthing is to do today I'd like to talk to you about what the birthing accomplishes how the birthing takes place what its purpose is by God it is an awesome thought to be given to the fact that after God had created everything and said it was good, he had in the back of his mind something that had never taken place in creation. After God had dealt with all the Old Testament saints, including Israel, for 4,000 years in the Old Testament and had done every miracle you could think of and had blessed all the people as they could possibly be blessed, the time came that God had still never given forth a secret that was in his mind. Most of us never think of God having secrets, but he had one great secret which he never released. Wasn't released in creation, wasn't released in Adam and Eve, wasn't released in any of the Old Testament saints. David didn't know it, Isaiah didn't know it, Abraham didn't know it. <coughs> the Apostle Paul said it was a liberating secret. He said in another place, it is something that God kept hidden until a special time. Well, that thing that God had kept hidden is what I'm talking about in this subject. The thing that was hidden was that the time would come, the day would come when God would have to birth his own children to have what he wanted. He never got what he wanted out of the first uh, 23 or 2400 years of time. There he dealt with a lot of Gentiles. There he dealt with evil nations. There he performed unbelievable miracles, but he never got what he wanted. Then finally, he set aside one group of people called Israel in the hope that he would get out of Israel the thing that he needed. And what was the big thing God needed? What was the most important thing God needed? It's simple. He needed somebody to love him. That's all God's ever wanted because God is love. He's a miracle worker. He's a creator. He's heavenly father. He's a whole lot of things. But the most descriptive thing about God is he's love. And that's all he ever wanted from a creature. He didn't get it out of any creatures until Jesus died on the cross. And then that one who died on the cross is the one who loved him more than human beings could ever know. So he had in the back of his mind something that must be done. Sooner or later, a thing must take place, and the thing to take place would be he would have to birth his own children. Now, birthing his own children is one thing, but the way he would birth them was an entirely different matter. Just to bring forth children 
I suppose, is an easy thing. But to bring forth the kind of child he wanted that would love him, it would be necessary that he took a part of himself and put it in that creature. That's exactly what he did, and that's what the secret was. The thing that was hidden in God from the beginning of time and before time started was that the time would come he would have to birth his own children. That is, he would have to take these creatures he had already created and rebirth them. So one day Jesus was talking, one night Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, and Nicodemus said, you're a great miracle worker and you're a teacher sent from God. Jesus had one explosive thing on his mind, and for the first time in 4,000 years of time since creation, it came out. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again. Well, of course, Nicodemus didn't understand that, and Jesus didn't take time to explain it to him. And the reason Christ didn't take time to explain it to Nicodemus was because it was something yet to happen. It was yet to come, and God had a plan by which he would bring forth this liberating secret. And so time went on until the moment was at hand that God would do this awesome thing. There was something necessary, however, before God could reveal this thing that he would birth his own children. And the thing that was necessary was that he would have to slay, kill his most priceless possession to get what he wanted. Now, since he's a God of love, makes you question if he's a God of love, why would he take his most priceless possession and kill it? Well, it's simple. The reason he took his most priceless possession was because he was a God of love. He would pay any price possible to get out of humanity what it was he wanted. He wanted humanity to fall in love with him. Because of all he'd done, because of who he was, he wanted humanity to love him. So what happened was Jesus died on the cross, and that was the final stroke. That was necessary in order to make this plan of God complete. In order to complete Ephesians 1 and 4, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, we must have the Lamb slain. And so the text that I want to read to you today to help you come to this understanding is in 1 Peter, and I want to begin reading, if I can, at the... Well, let's see. Begin reading at the 18th verse. 1 Peter 1 and 18. Get it in your Bibles and mark these verses because they are prime scriptures. In fact, these scriptures introduce you to the cross, which is a substantiating power of God's plan. It's all wrapped up in the cross until he takes his most priceless possession to show how much he loves humanity we can never have the heart of God, or the gospel as we have it today. Beginning to read verse 18, it says, For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver and gold from your vain conversation, your daily walk, received by tradition from your fathers, but you were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. He took his most priceless possession and killed it. Verse 20, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Now remember, it is important that you have this understanding that there are two things God did before time started as we know it. Two things happened before creation. These two things are the powers that uphold the true gospel of Jesus Christ. The first is Ephesians 1 and 4, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And the second is this 20th verse of 1 Peter 1, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world. Now you know in the Christ's life message, we make a big point on the word before. It's used very few times in the scriptures, but each time it is used, it reverts back to something that was in God's mind before time started. If you don't have that in your mind, you'll never know what the true gospel of Jesus Christ is. The true gospel is based on two factors which God himself must work out. Factor one is Ephesians 1 and 4, chosen before the world was created. Number two is the lamb slain before 
the world was created. Those are the two things that have motivated God's plan and have brought it about as God intended. So those are, there are strong principles in the gospel, the final gospel I call it, and Paul called it my gospel. Before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, back at verse 20, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory that your faith and hope might be in God. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit under the unfeigned love of the brethren, see that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now here's our text. Being born again, not of the corruptible seed, but of the incorruptible by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So we have before us this term, born again. Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must, must be born again, or you cannot see or enter the things that are in the kingdom. Now then, I can say on the basis of Paul's epistles, that unless one is born again and knows what it means to be born again, they cannot see or enter the things of God. You understand that? The new birth is what makes the difference. Being birthed by this Father makes the big difference. There are people who come along and say, well, I've had a great vision. I had a, a prophecy. God showed me this and God showed me that. But Paul would say, and Peter would say on the basis of these scriptures, they both would say that unless you understand what it means to be born again and understand how it happens, nothing else matters. You won't get it. You won't get it. You won't get a hold of it. It won't work. It only works because of the new birthing. Because in the new birthing, you have another life with another understanding for that life. That's why there is the gospel given to Paul that he called my gospel. It takes another understanding to understand Christ in you, the hope of glory. You can't understand it with previous scripture. You can't get it out of the Old Testament. Jesus of Nazareth did not even explain it to Nicodemus when Nicodemus asked him to. So it is something that was held in God's mind in order that he might raise up a group of people whom he would birth himself and these would be the people who would come and live in his house. So being born again hinges on your understanding of what happened when you were saved. Ninety percent of people, here I go back to my statistics again which really aren't worth a nickel but I have to have something to talk about. 90% of Christian people have no concept of the seed that was put in them. In fact, they still are trying to perfect the corruptible seed. Are you aware of that? Are you aware that most Christian religion is given to the correction of the saints? They are given to the correction of the corruptible seed. Now, we all had a corruptible seed in us. And when we got saved, sadly, most of us were led to believe, now you're going to be a better person. You're going to do things better. You're going to do what you couldn't do before. Well, that gives an inference that you're going to be corrected, that the blood of Jesus Christ has washed away your sin and corrected. No. Or that you have received a work of the Holy Spirit and you're corrected. No. The correction is out and done forever in grace. Because what happens, another seed, an incorruptible seed, takes the place of the corruptible seed so that your past, everything that's happened to you in the first seed, everything that had to do with your natural family, everything that had to do with your earth living up to that point is out. Amen. To God, it's done away with. So you're going to be rebirthed with an incorruptible seed, a seed that cannot sin. Now don't get upset with me when I tell you that when Christ is joined to your spirit, that's a perfect relationship with God. That the moment a sinner is saved, he's saved in his spirit. Christ has come to dwell in him. But more than that, the seed Christ is in him. You understand what a seed is? I have several oak trees right around this property. 
And in the fall, acorns fall off that tree by the hundreds and the thousands, and I've got a lot of squirrels on this property that take care of them. I'm sure that if I rustle about, I could find enough acorns stowed away somewhere by these squirrels because they love to eat them. An acorn. I have small acorns here. They're not any bigger than the tip of my finger. That's how small they are. But did you know that in that acorn there is a trunk of a tree that could be four foot around? There are huge brain, uh, uh, branches on that tree that can rise up in the air 40 and 50 feet. There are thousands of leaves on that tree. There is an innumerable amount of vegetation coming out of that one little seed. It's all in that one seed. It's all there. And when you were born again, that's what God did. He put that seed in you. That's the incorruptible seed. In Peter's words here, from the Greek, I understand it says sperm. We have been rebirthed by the sperm of God incorruptible, sinless, everlasting. He put his sperm in a believing sinner. Now, that sounds probably something you understand, but the ramifications of that goes beyond all finite comprehension because with that seed in you, everything you know about religion has changed. I met a man last night. I was in meetings last night in Topeka, Kansas. I mean, uh, Wichita, Kansas. And in, a man came up to me, and he said, I finally got it. And so I thought he was going to tell me he finally caught on to the Christ life. No, he said, I finally got it. I said, well, what is it you got? Oh, he said, I got it for the first time that the seed that was put in me was total, and I didn't need to carry anything from my old life of religion into that seed to make it work. Amen. He said, I got it. He said, I've been hearing you talk that when you come to the knowledge that Christ lives in you, you've got to start all over in your religious education. And he said, I'm ready to start over now. I got, I got it fixed. That nothing I have learned, no place I have been. And he said, I've been baptized two or three times by different churches just to get in them. But he said, nowhere I have been have I... <coughs> come to the place I am now in Christ and he said my love for God is so great now I willingly forfeit everything I've learned up till now well I wanted to go into detail and tell him he'd learned a lot of good things he'd probably been in some good church buildings and had some good preachers uh, but that didn't fit right then he may be able to use his past but he had to be willing to start all over because he has that incorruptible seed in him which is like an acorn that has a huge oak tree inside of it. That's what happened to you when you were born again. Now the Apostle Paul came to this understanding. He came to it. And the more he was involved in it, the less religion he promoted. When he finally got in his prison epistles, there was no religion left. There was no, no need any longer to separate the Jewish message and the Christian message. There was no uh, any, any use to talk about the past anymore. When he got in the prison epistles, it was a whole new world. And it will be to you whenever you get to that spot. It isn't that the first seven epistles are not good. They are. Those first seven epistles are what we call the Acts epistles. That's uh, Romans, first and second uh, Corinthians, that's uh, Galatians, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, and uh, the book of Hebrews, and one more, what am I forgetting? <laughs> Romans, did I say Romans? First seven epistles are Acts epistles. This is where Paul is receiving this revelation. This is where Jesus is talking to him. And in the course of these many revelations, the Holy Spirit is helping him to formulate the message, what it's all about. We're going to talk about that 
here sometime because there were strategic things that Paul drew out of the revelations he had of Christ. Strategic things that unless you catch them in his writings, you can't get to the core of the message. He knew what he was doing. God had raised him up for that very purpose. And so what finally happened, God had to raise him up a man who would bring forth this message. Now, it is interesting to note that the Apostle Paul never uses the term born again. It isn't that he didn't believe it, but when he heard this message that God was going to birth his own children, it came to him, this is the most awesome thing I've heard. This is a great mystery. This is something that people who've been serving God for hundreds and thousands of years didn't come up with. And here I was out in the desert and God revealed His Son in me and I'm left to handle this message as, as the apostle to the Gentiles, raised up by God. He's given me this special dispensation and now I've got to bring this message. I've got to tell everybody what is meant by being rebirthed, born again. And you know what? He came up with these things by the Spirit that are necessary to come to this understanding. I'm not going into the detail of what those specific things were because they, they entail a whole message on their own. But I do want to talk to you about some of the facts that have to do with this birthing. Facts that are important. I don't know how many we'll get to, but I'm going to start with number one. The birthing, when the seed is put in a believing sinner and he's born again, this is not a human experience. Put that in your notes like that. It is not a human experience. What is meant by that? Well, most things that we have to happen to us in religion are all human experiences. You know, I've, I've been preaching over 50 years, and I saw early days, to me, early days in the church, I saw a day when, uh, when they, they had church buildings that had no carpet in it. Now you can't find church buildings that don't have carpet in it. I can remember a day when they didn't have padded pews. In fact, I preached a number of revivals to people who sat on planks with no back on them. So time has moved on, you see. Custom has taken its place. And we're doing everything we can now to make people comfortable in the things of God. The bigger and the better, the more attraction it is to people. The bigger the building, the more people that are there, the more famous the preacher. All of these are earmarks. Something great is going on here. Something wonderful is happening there. It is an attempt on religious people's part to try to make this birthing of God a human experience. And you can't do it. It's not a human experience. When anyone is born again, there is not any feeling so that they say, look what I did. When the seed was put in you, the moment you believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you had no pain. You had no hurt. You had no feeling, really. In fact, the majority of people who are born again did not know what happened to them the moment they believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. They didn't know that God put His sperm in them and caused another person to be birthed inside of that human vessel. It wasn't a human experience at all. In fact, God does not explain it any better today when a sinner is saved than Jesus explained it to Nicodemus when he first mentioned it. Because it's not a human thing. It's a thing of the Spirit. It's a thing where God joins His Son to your spirit. Paul says it in famous words, He that is joined to the Lord is one spirit. 
one spirit. When a woman gets pregnant, she has, outside of the ecstasy of the moment, she has no feeling. In fact, she'll go a month, six weeks, or whatever before she even finds out if she has the seed in her. So it is with God. Did you know that there has never been anybody born again that didn't have the God seed in them? Because there is no other kind of salvation. Right. We got Baptist salvation these days. We got Pentecostal salvation. We got Episcopalian salvation. We got Catholic salvation. But you can't be genuinely saved without that seed in you. And when it comes into you, you haven't the slightest idea it happened. Just like a woman gets pregnant and doesn't know for some period of time what it's all about. It's not a human experience. It's not an ecstasy where you can say, oh, I got a hold of this thing. I've been praying for it for years. No, sir. It's a gift of God to birth his own children. So it's, it's real, but it's in the spirit. I was listening to a, a dear brother on the radio yesterday uh, as I was driving out to the airport. And he was talking about letting Jesus come into your heart. Now, he, he has a huge church. There are a few churches bigger than his, and he wins a lot of souls. But he's got Jesus coming into their heart. He's trying to save souls. But you see, that's language that doesn't belong to the incorruptible seed because salvation is not of the soul. Salvation is of the spirit where Christ is joined to our spirit, where it's a spiritual thing that God does and not a soulish thing. True, our souls need to be saved, but you never get that perfectly. But you can be saved in spirit perfectly. Amen. Perfectly. The purpose of this message is is as Paul said, where was it, Colossians, where he said, our mission is to present every man perfect before God. How can I present anybody perfect before God? By preaching the gospel to them, by bringing them the truth, because they are already perfect. God's done it. He has done it whether man knows it or not. Christ is in them. The seed is Christ. So they have the totality of what God could give in the seed. Salvation, in its original sense, is not soulish. It's a thing of the Spirit. Now, try to understand this. In the Old Testament, the only way people were saved was in their soul. Amen. And that's why soul is a big word in the Old Testament. And that's why us, we, when we came to know the Lord, were told that our soul got mm -hmm. saved. Uh, it didn't. We were told that we're in a soul-winning business. We're not. We were told that this is a soul-winning preacher and a soul-winning church. We're not. The soul can only be fed by the Spirit. The soul can only grow as the knowledge of who you are in Christ takes place. Go through Paul's epistle and mark certain words he says, like in Philippians 3, where he said, I have suffered the loss of all things for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. He didn't suffer the loss of everything to be a great preacher or to have a good testimony. He suffered the loss of everything for the excellency of the knowledge that Christ lived in him. So it's not a soulish thing. Your soul is being saved every day. Why? Because that's where your intellect, will, and emotions are located. And in these three aspects of your soulish part, you're growing. You're making decisions. You make some good decisions. You make some bum decisions. You have some good days. You have some bad days. That's all in your soulish part. We'll get to that later because that's one thing Paul straightened out when he said the human is spirit, soul, and body. What does our salvation rest on? If there's no great feeling to it, because if you jump up and say, I feel saved, you're a little premature. It isn't in feeling. Your feeling is in your soulish part. That's where you feel better. You feel more godly. You feel more righteous. <clears throat> That's just a feeling. And if you felt that way at night, 
probably the next morning you felt the very opposite. So don't depend on that. But your knowing is important. Paul could say, I know in whom I have believed. I know this thing. How do you know it? The Word says so. The Holy Spirit has taught me that Christ lives in me. Now, no one can identify the seed in them. So don't run around telling people, oh, I've got the sperm of God in me. <laughs> you can't identify it like that. You're not supposed to. It's supposed to out, be outworking in you, working out of you. Then how am I to know? You read the Scriptures. The Scriptures. You get in Paul's epistles and stay there till it gets fixed in your mind what happened to you when you were saved because Paul goes through it. He deals with it. He speaks of it clearly. You don't have to worry about it or fret over it. You simply need to believe it and accept it. So this brings up my next point. This birthing, this seed in you is not progressive. It's not progressive. And so much in religion is progressive. I got a friend that has a big church up in the Northwest, and he has a thing he calls catechism classes. And everybody that comes into that church has to go through these classes. And so I'll say to him, why, why do you make everybody do that? He says, well, they have to do that uh, because that'll make sure they got it all. Make sure they got it all. He said, I, I don't want anybody in here don't have it all. And so I say to him, is there a little bit? Yeah, they get a little bit, but not much. I said, you don't understand a birthing, do you? A little girl that gets pregnant didn't get a little bit. She got it all. She got it all. And that may seem funny to you, but I'm going to tell you, when any sinner in sincerity asks Jesus to save him, he gets it all. Amen. He gets it all right then and there. And you know what? It isn't based on him. He may be a crook. He may be a liar. He may be a whole bunch of things. But when he said, Lord, I need a Savior, please help me, he got it all. On what basis? The cross. Amen. The cross. God don't save people because they're all honest and good. He saves them because that son of his gave his life on the cross Amen. that we might be redeemed. There's no such thing as progressive salvation. Now, there's progressive consecration. There's progressive faith. There's progressive holiness. Shouldn't be, but there is. Religion has all of these things progressive. The reason why religion likes things progressive is that that holds you at a point where you're beholden. Beholden. That's, don't you, you're Texan, you know what I mean. You're beholden to God. So what do you do when you're beholden? You pay a bigger price. You're first in the offering. You're first in mowing the lawn at the church. You're first at doing the hard work. You're beholden. It's progressive. That must be so because I had a preacher friend tell me one time, he said, if I told my people they had Christ living in them, I don't think any of them would come back to church. They'd say, well, I got it all. <laughs> Already got it all. So I said to him, are you willing to forfeit the most important thing God ever did for your church members on the basis that you can't trust the Holy Spirit to deal with them? He's bewildered. No, I can't do that. <clears throat> the placing of the seed is instantaneous. I don't know how it happened that night in Bethlehem. Little 14-year-old girl, I imagine that she was awakened. And there stood at the foot of her bed a, an angel. And the angel said, this night there has been birthed in you the Savior of the world. Did she know about it before? Nope. 
Blessed and holy art thou among all women, little Mary. But how many young Jewish girls could have fit that description? When that angel talked to her, it was already done. It was done. It was finished. The seed was placed. And from that moment on, she bore the Savior in her body. It's instantaneous. You say, well, are you saying just anybody that believes is going to be saved? Yep. Yep. Oh, I admit there's a whole lot of people say they're saved that weren't honest and sincere. But I'm not the one to judge that. I watch their life and I see them live more in the world than in grace. And so I say, Lord, you'll have to take care of them. That's bigger than I can handle that's more than I can handle. It's up to you, Father. And you know, I, that's not a hard thing. I'm, I'm telling somebody that every week, wherever I go. Some dear lady comes to me and says, pray for my children. I say, the best thing you do is turn them over to God. She said, well, I've tried lots of times and I just can't seem to do it. I said, you can do it. They'll hurt you enough to where you will do it. You'll turn them over to God. You'll carry the load no longer. It'll be too heavy for you. You'll turn it over. It's instantaneous. It's not progressive. Furthermore, when the seed is put there, it's like the acorn. It's totally complete. There are no bad seeds. There's no bad seed from God. It's perfect. It's total. It's complete. Think about it. It's perfect. When Christ is joined to your spirit, that's a perfect relationship. Modern religion doesn't understand that word perfect. And so most all the new Bibles have stricken out the word perfect and put down perfecting or growing or, or come to our church and we'll show you how good you can be. <laughs> They've taken out the word perfect. You know why? Because they don't understand the birthing. They don't know what God has done when a sinner is saved. And I want to say this about the perfect seed. I believe that if every sinner that comes to God had an understanding of the gospel, at least a very slight or even a vain understanding of the gospel, that God was going to put his incorruptible seed in them, that that would be locked into their spirit, that would be eternal life dwelling in them at that instant, if they knew Christ was in them, how much better they would live. But you know how we start them out? I used to do this. <clears throat> when I had the big tent and we had the altar workers, we gave the altar workers instruction. The people came forward. They went into a little tent beside the big tent and, and gave their hearts to the Lord and so forth. And we gave them instructions. Tell them, do this now. Find a good church. Read your Bible every day. Pray every night before you go to bed. Bring your tithes and offerings into the Lord. By the time we got through that list, <laughs> you, see, you see what it was? We put them to the law immediately when God by grace had dropped the whole bucket of grace right on top of them. We didn't tell them Christ lives in you. We didn't tell them that whatever can be done for God can be done through your life. Commit it to this Christ that lives in you. No, sir. We put them to work right off. We couldn't trust the Holy Spirit. We couldn't trust the Father who had birthed a child of His. We couldn't trust Him. It was a perfect work, and God knew what he was doing. So this means that when they are rebirthed, it's total. Not a little bit of Jesus, but total. Not a little bit of grace, but total. Not a little bit of this and a little bit of that, it's total. 
They don't need one thing from the preacher. Not even water baptism will make it better. They don't need anything from the church. Joining the church won't make it any better. They got the seed. The incorruptible seed is in them. It's perfect. It's everlasting. And you can't add to it. It's total. I'm sitting here looking at this young fellow sitting right here. <clears throat> I remember the day he was born. Robbie and I was uh, out in meeting somewhere. So his daddy called and said, uh, the baby has come. This baby. The baby has come. Well, I said, is it all right? Is everything all right? And you know what my son said? He said, it's total. <laughs> He's got ten toes. He's got ten fingers. He's got two eyes, two ears, and nose. That's what my son said. He said he's got it all. Now don't, don't mess that up any. <coughs> you understand that? When, when, when you get saved, you got it all. I grew up in a religion that said you didn't get it till you got holy. You didn't get it till you sanctified. And when you started getting it, you need more. You need more. I still got books in my library that are more books. You got to get more. Nobody ever told me what was in the bucket of grace. They just told me you need more buckets. Come over here to our church. We got a better work than this place you're going now. But when you were saved, the whole thing God could give you was in the seed and that's why I use the connotation that uh, the whole bucket of grace is dumped on you. I got that out of the NFL football. When a coach wins, they take the, the cooler and they dump the whole thing on him. It came to me one day. That's what happened. When I got saved, he dumped the whole bucket on me. See, It's not coming. It's there. But you see, the trouble with people living that is they don't know anything about it. How can I expect a poor soul that was bound by the devil one minute and then held in the grace of God the next to know anything? What does he need now? He needs the salvation of his soul. He doesn't know anything. He doesn't know what to do with his will. He doesn't know what to do with his emotions. And yet he's had this awesome thing to take place. Let's go to another point. When anybody is born again, they have had absolutely nothing to do with it. Nothing. Let's go back to a little baby in the womb. That little baby didn't have any kind of vote as to what womb he would end up in. Nothing. He had no vote on who's going to be my daddy. He had no vote on who's going to be my mama. He had no choices. It just happens. It just happens. That's what irritates me so when they say that women have choices. Sure they do. That little thing in them doesn't have any choices. No choices. He couldn't choose his mom or daddy. He couldn't choose the house he'd live in. He couldn't choose what kind of money his family had. He couldn't have a family arrangement so they talk all this over ahead of time. He was just there. When you were born again, you had no choice in the matter. Why isn't the incorruptible seed and the birthing message taught by religion today? It is not only that they don't understand it, but it isn't taught because only God can explain what's going to take place. And that's going to come over time. You're not going to get it the night you're saved. You're not going to get it ten years later maybe when you're teaching a Sunday school class. But in the course of time, if you stick with the Scriptures, you're going to come up with this thing that, my goodness, I had no choice in this matter. It was a God thing from the beginning to the end.
What makes you think you have choices now? Have we gotten so smart and wise now that we got a whole lot of choices? Have we ignored the fact that it isn't us that lives anyhow? So why in the world am I bothered with all these choices? Why? I love a little piece over in the book of Acts. I love to preach where the line says, God has set the bounds of our habitation. You don't really have a choice where you live. Young fella come to me not long ago, and he said, pray for me that I'll get another job. I said, well, you're not working? Oh, yeah, I said, I'm working now, but he said, I'm in an ungodly place, and I need to get out of this place. I said, well, how come you took the job there in the first place? Well, he said, I needed money, and that was a job that opened, and I felt all right when it started. But as I've gone along, there's no Christians there, there's no good people there, and I'm ready to get out of it. He was looking for sympathy. I had none. <laughs> I said, that kind of means that you're the only Christian there. Yep, I'm sure it is. I never saw another one. I said, are you willing to take the only Christ that's in that big plant you work in? Are you ready to take him away from the people who need him more than life itself? Because when you leave, there'll be no Christ there. Would you be willing to wait on God until he opened another door for you and stay where you are faithful? His head dropped. I had punctured his balloon. He thought, sure, I was going to believe for him to get a bigger, better job. But he had missed the point on being a Christian. The seed that was in him is bigger than anything else. You don't choose what you'll do. When you do, you get in trouble. I can point people out to you everywhere who made choices about what they're going to do with their life. And I can tell you they were bum choices and some of them have become bums themselves. It isn't your life, it's His. He'll use you, He'll bless you, but it isn't your life, it's His. That seed is still in you. Christ is still joined to your spirit. Funny, man told me not long ago, he said, I'm going to get away from this message. I said, how come? He said, I just don't want to think about it anymore. Well, I said, are you going to get away from the Christ that's been joined to you? I said, if you can find out a way to get away from him, let me know. The hound of heaven will catch you. Well, God had nothing to tell you when you got saved other than that you're his child, you're his offspring, and you always will be. Now, if you don't find out things about that, you can have a hell on earth as a Christian. If you never get into this gospel where Paul plainly elaborates upon it and tells us the details of living this life. If you never get into it, you can have a hell on earth. There are going to be a lot of people who go to heaven that's already been in hell. They've never gotten out of trouble. They've never made good decisions. They've never reckoned this seed that's in them. They've never seen Christ in them. They go to church buildings that never mention it. They hear somebody saying, oh, you can get a miracle if you'll just believe but the miracle that's in them is bigger than anything you could receive. Amen. And they don't know about it. They've never entered into it. So you don't have anything to do with it. It's a thing of God. How could God do that? By what stretch of the imagination, let's say, could God do that to a believing sinner? A sinner that just wants to get out of his misery, get out of the hell he's in, get out of the problems he's got, trust God like all the rest of these church members that everything's working out good. That's a lie. 
that everything's going to work out better. That's not the truth. But he wants it. He wants it. And you know what? He'll go that route and never find out about the Christ that lives in him. This is the work of the cross. What right does God have to put an incorruptible seed in a believing sinner? The cross. He paid the price for it. He's looking for a lover, and he paid the price to get you. He paid the price to get your life to be his message alive on this earth. He paid the price for it. He's got a right to it. He really doesn't have to tell you anything about it, but he hopes you'll love him enough that you'll get into the Word, and when you get into this Scripture and it opens up to you, devoid of your religion, devoid of your doctrines, devoid of everything you know, and start listening to Paul, who is the only man who knows about Christ living in another human in this Bible. Amen. Get into it, and all of a sudden it'll begin to break. Revelation will begin to come. God reveal will reveal His Son to you in a remarkable, wonderful way. Let's go to another point. That seed in you is eternal. It's eternal. Everything in its nature is eternal. That's why Peter says, be partakers of his divine nature. Because everything in the God nature is eternal. It's not a come and go thing. It's not a pay as you go thing either. You don't get a little here and a little there. I, I get so tired of running into people say, well, I went over there to try to get a blessing. I didn't get it, but I heard they got a thing going over here and I'm going to go over there and get a blessing. I'm going to go where the fire's falling. I'm going to go where there's God doing great things. How do you think that makes the Christ in you feel? Boy, you got quiet then, didn't you? <laughs> Does he have a mind? Does he have any sense? Does he have any feeling? Is it really a person of Christ? Yes. Sure it is. Paul called him the person of Christ is what works through him. The life I live, the only life he had, he said that he lived was Christ. How do you think it makes this Jesus feel that lives in you? I can think of all the stupid things I did. And every time I did a stupid thing, I said, Oh, God, I thought I was led of your spirit. Please help me out. I blamed it on him. You can become an expert at that. Just let old self lead you along and always blame it on the Holy Spirit or blame it on God. But I want to tell you something. This thing's eternal. It's not a coming and a going experience. It's eternal. There are multitudes of people who have been born again who don't know Christ lives in them, who have slipshod, haphazard life, who sin regularly with Christ joined to their spirit. You know what God does when that happens? You know what he does? He's got a wood barn. He's got a wood barn. When I was a kid growing up, my daddy had an old garage. And when he said, we're going to the garage, I knew I better start thinking. I had to correct something somewhere. chastened. Every son that he has, he chastens. Not just those who do bad. The scripture said he chastens every son that he has. You're in training. Somebody says, well, I, what about these bad things that happened to me? I don't know exactly except he's chastening you. Well, he doesn't take a switch out and beat you. 
what he does is that this one that you've always claimed opened the door for me. The Lord was there to help me. He's there to help you again. Amen. You know what? He says, I think I'll let you go into a hard place. Chastening. Does he put sickness on us? That's a foolish question. I don't know. We all get sick. But I know that in the Lord, he lets things happen to us that strengthen us. Nobody had a harder life in this Bible than the Apostle Paul. He went through more than anybody else. Left dying three times. That's rough. He lived in the day of grace. But he came out every time saying, His grace is sufficient. He took care of me. He was there. I used to preach that if you got faith, you're going to get out of it. God's going to bring you out if you got faith. Look at the Old Testament. Don and I have been having a little fun with the Old Testament word faith. <clears throat> Would you believe this? That the word faith is only mentioned two times in the Old Testament. In 4,000 years, only two times was the word faith mentioned in your Bible. Isn't that strange? All these faith preachers grabbed the Old Testament first to preach to you because there's a lot of doer religion there. In fact, you had to do to be saved. Isn't that strange? Well, I want to tell you something. Not more faith you need, my friend. You've been birthed by this Father. Amen. You need to trust that Father. Absolutely. Trust is a bigger word than faith in grace. It's a bigger word. You need to trust Him. If He birthed you, tell Him. So glad you birthed me, Father. I'm in a mess now. Would you help this son out in the hog pen? <laughs> what will He say? He'll do His best to bring you to yourself, to who you really are. That's what every crisis in life is. It's God bringing us to who we are what it says about the boy in the hog pen when he came to himself. He began to say things differently. When you come to yourself, like in this message of the Christ life, when you come to yourself, you're going to think differently. You're going to say, my goodness, they got things better off my father's house than all these rich people I've been running with around here. You'll learn something. I could go on and on on this subject, but I got to stop. I want to tell you, His grace is sufficient. The seed is in you. He's been joined to your spirit. It's everlasting, eternal life. If you want to live it, the Holy Spirit will help you because He has one big purpose in you, and that's to reveal the Son. To reveal the Son. Let Him do it. Let Him reveal the Christ that is in you. Don't look for some greater thing Jesus of Nazareth can do. Ask the Holy Spirit to reveal the Christ that is in you. Now, right now because that's the only way you can ever be saved. With that, I quit. i got to say, this is the best-looking crowd I've seen in a long time, with one or two exceptions. You're great. <laughs> you're great. God love every one of you. Glad you're here. Take the message to heart, and it'll revolutionize you, set you free, and take you into a new strata, a new atmosphere with God. Love every one of you. Thank God for you. We never have a benediction in the Christ life. We just say so long till we get together again. But this is what I want you to remember. That person sitting next to you has Christ in them. Never forget that because you have Christ in you. Reach over and take your neighbor by the hand, will you? Take your neighbor by the hand. Look him in the eye. Look him in the eye and say, I see Jesus in you. I see Jesus in you, in your life and all that you do. I see Jesus in you, because I see Jesus in me. I see Jesus in me, in my life and all that I do. I see Jesus in me. That's it. Hug every neck you can. 
Till we get together again, God bless you.